West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netroomsradio.com Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Donald Trump's lawyer Alina Haba is refusing to answer a very simple question if Donald Trump will be receiving money from Saudi Arabia or Russia in order to post the $464 million bond that is due on Monday. Let me share with you right now Alina Haba saying that and then let's talk about it here. Play this clip. Um, Is there any effort on the part of your team to secure this money through another country, Saudi Arabia or Russia, as Joy Behar seems to think? Well, there's rules and regulations that are public. I can't speak about strategy that require certain things, and we have to follow those rules. Like I said, this is manifest injustice. It is impossible. It's an impossibility. I believe they knew that. I think that's why mid-trial, frankly, they changed their ask from $250 million to the ridiculous amount of money that they've asked for. I think everything is done intentionally. I do not doubt that the witch hunt, that the election interference goal is what was uh, ringing steady and loud loudly and true throughout all these trials, frankly, and we're seeing it. It's the demise of our country, not the demise of Trump. So we'll we'll handle it as we always have and, and keep our heads up and keep right. working hard. Wow. So Alina Haba, Donald Trump's lawyer, cannot answer that very basic question about whether Donald Trump is compromised by Saudi Arabia, whether Donald Trump is compromised by Russia, whether Donald Trump is compromised by foreign entities. In that same interview, by the way, Alina Haba also spends the time trying to dodge other questions and just brag about how Donald Trump and the Trump Organization built the New York skyline, she tries to to say here, play this clip. Tell me a little bit about where you are in this process, because in terms of the appeals happening or the appeals court deciding, the appellate division deciding that perhaps they're going to make some modifications to this judgment. Right. Well, our argument in front of the appellate division is that forcing him to sell prized properties such as Trump Tower, iconic properties like 40 Wall Street, to pursue his appeal is manifest injustice. And it deprives him of that due process that we are all entitled to. So imagine you can't reverse selling off Trump Tower on a fire sale at a discounted price. We can't fix that if we win on an appeal. So it's complete injustice. And only a handful of sureties, as we stated, are approved by the United States Department of Treasury to even underwrite bonds of this size. So of those, even those very limited handful amounts, they're limited to policies with even single bonds up to maybe 100 million. None of them accept hard assets. They require cash or cash cash equivalents, such as marketable securities. The ask of Judge Ingorin is 
completely ridiculous. He knew that, or if he didn't know that, then he should have educated himself on it. But it is intentionally to interfere in the election, to hurt President Trump, to try and ruin his company and ruin a person and a family whose private company, not public company, has made the skyline of New York changed forever and made so many jobs, created jobs, taxes to New York. It's a disgrace, Martha. So we're waiting on those reasons that we've stated in our appeal um, and many more. But that's just a summary of what we're waiting on the appellate division to do. do. Have, Alina, do you have any- And by the way, when she says that, that's not exactly helpful to her cause. Uh, while her, while she and the legal team are arguing that Donald Trump does not have the funds in order to post the surety bond, when you're just bragging about how wealthy he is and how great he is, and you continue to lie, that's not exactly helpful from a legal perspective. And by the way, a few weeks back, Eric Trump did the same. It was this is where he says that his daddy built the skyline, which again is just utterly false. Here, play this clip. My father built the skyline of New York City. And this is the thanks he gets? And here in that interview, Eric Trump also brags about that they're the best company in all of the United States, the best real estate company there is. Here, play this clip. They wouldn't be doing this. This has never been tried in New York before. There's no better real estate company in the country than, than us. By the way, this is what Alina Haba was doing this past week. There she is with uh, someone named for Forgadio or Fagaccio Blow, who's the, the MAGA rapper right there, who's done rap songs about uh, murdering his girlfriend. And it's a really disgusting video, I won't even show it. Um, but there's Alina Haba, you see her, Donald Trump's lawyer, with a, a Donald Trump uh, uh, chain. I'm not sure if that's real gold. I, I certainly doubt it. And a big MAGA ring right there next to uh, the the MAGA rapper uh, for Gashio Blow, Peter Henline, who's a uh, DeSantis supporter, um, but who's been you know on point in his criticisms of Donald Trump, says, if you feel bad that Trump has lost $550 million over the last few months, don't. It was his choice to hire this woman as his lawyer instead of picking somebody competent. And again, this is something that um, is important to always reflect upon with Donald Trump is because it is the most incompetent people. It is the most, you know, you know, unqualified, disastrous people who he wants to have control your life. Y'all remember a few weeks back what Alina Habba said when she was on the same show and she was being interviewed and she said that Donald Trump is so rich, he's so wealthy, it's going to be easy for him to pay. Remember that? Here, play this clip. No, I mean, I would never get into anything privileged, but I can tell you what the rules are. And within 30 days, even if we choose to appeal this, which we will, we have to post the bond, which is the full amount and some, um, and uh, we will be prepared to do that. So, is, but how much is the bond? Well, it so it's you're, you have to break it up. So there were obviously individual defendants that got fined. There was the company that got fined. But you're looking at roughly, let's call it close to four hundred million dollars for something that he did nothing wrong. Look, it's no coincidence, and I'll say it. They know by looking at his statements of financial condition that this guy is worth a lot of money, billions and billions of billions of dollars, and that didn't even include his brand, Martha. But what they're trying to do between this case, between my last case is put him out of business. It's not going to work, number one. Number two, what they're doing is a scare tactic. Unfortunately, they picked the wrong guy to pick on, in my opinion, because he's strong, he's resilient, and he happens to have a lot of cash. Now, that does Here's the thing. Yeah, and that's Donald Trump's lawyer right there. That's Alina Haba. That's who is representing Donald Trump in the New York Attorney General civil fraud case. That's who's representing Donald Trump in the E. Jean Carroll case. So over $550 million in losses right there. And by the way, I mean, Trump lost the first E. Jean Carroll case, but where he had a competent lawyer, um, you know, even though I, I thought that Joe Takapina you know, made some big mistakes in representing Donald Trump, but that's besides the point. That verdict was $5 million. Alina Habba took a $5 million verdict and turned it into a combined over $550 million verdict. And Donald Trump is now, uh, 
as you know, filing with the appellate division, saying that it's he's basically a mom and pop shop. He's basically saying that there's never been a supersedious, there's never been a bond that has to be posted this big, and you know this is so rare. And then um, we're doing a whole nother video on this, but New York Attorney General Letitia James responded with a sir reply and said, "Excuse me, what are you talking about? Like." Bonds like this get posted by large public corporations. This is not some unique thing. New York Attorney General Letitia James cites with specificity all of the case law where and all of the cases where bonds of this size were posted with, you know, real legitimate corporations. Um, Meanwhile, Donald Trump is also spending his time filing defamation lawsuits against uh, George Stephanopoulos and ABC because uh, Donald Trump alleges that when Stephanopoulos said that Donald Trump uh, in Gade was found liable for rape, that Donald Trump claims it was only sexual assault regarding E. Jean Carroll, despite the fact that federal judge Lewis Kaplan found that what happened was technically rape and that was in an order by federal judge Lewis Kaplan, but that's what Donald Trump is doing, and that's what Donald Trump is spending his time doing. And of course, he's, you know, in the past 48 hours, I don't know what he's posted almost 50 times post, 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 post whining about um, uh, the, the bond that he has to post and saying how outrageous it is and saying that he actually won. It was a complete victory, he says, just over and over again. I'm not even going to read these posts to you because, again, it's just so whiny over and over again. But there you have it, you know, in, in her own words, that's what Alina Habba says. Oh, and by the way, talking about, uh, you know, getting money from the Saudis, Jared Kushner, who got a combined $3 billion from Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and UAE, when he was asked recently, uh, he did an interview he was asked recently about um, uh, the money that he got from Saudi Arabia, you know, and I think about this as, as the MAGA Republicans keep holding these like just totally pointless hearings on um, Hunter Biden, which have nothing to do with anything. When Jared Kushner, who actually worked in a place, worked in the White House when he did not have a security clearance, cannot get the security clearance, but Trump didn't care. And then Kushner and what obviously looks like a quid pro quo, at least to, to, to me, tell me what you think. Um, he then got $3 billion from uh, from Saudi Arabia. Then when he's asked about it, he was like, are we still really talking about this? Are we, we really having this conversation? Dude, you got $3 billion from the Saudis who say that you're in their pocket. Here, play this clip. As you said, uh, lots and lots of private equity firms, other folks are, are trying to raise money from Saudi Arabia and, and are raising money from Saudi Arabia. Some, however, stopped after the Jamal Khashoggi murder. Some some either gave money back or stopped. At the time, you didn't really, you said you wanted to wait for the DNI report, for, for the kind of official report for the State Department report before talking about it. You kind of only give uh, very glancing mentions in your book to it. The DNI report came out a couple weeks after you left the White House. It says that MBS personally was responsible. Do you agree with the DNI? Do you or do you believe that report? Are we really still doing this, Dan? I mean, yeah, okay. absolutely. So, so let, let's go to this. Um, the way that we looked at our policy at the time was let's focus on what's in the interest no, of No, no, I'm not, I'm not arguing that. I, but but the, you, at the time you said you wanted to wait and see what the, kind of what the U.S. government determined. The U.S. government's made a determination. You're obviously still in business with him. Do you, do you believe the U.S. government? assessment? You might not. I'm, but do you so, believe So it? let me say this. I have not seen the DNI report that the Biden administration... Look, I know the person who I dealt with. I think he's a visionary leader. I think what he's done in that region is transformational. I think that when we started working with Saudi Arabia in 2017, I remember getting a list of all the transformative things that they wanted to do. I remember taking it then to uh, Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State, National Security Advisor, and saying, do you think there's a chance that Saudi Arabia will start doing these things, allowing women to drive, um, getting rid of the guardianship rules, uh, uh, reducing the uh, the power of the religious police, trying to modernize their economy, giving that next generation hope? They said, will never happen. I'd go to the meetings in the Situation Room. I was the only one who was going because everyone thought that it was going to be a big failure as policy. Folks, uh, you know, one of the reasons I posted the DeSantis supporter right there is that at the, this is a very unique situation. This is a very unique election. Ooh, this is not Democrat v. Republican in a traditional sense. This is pro-democracy and normalcy versus, I mean, you know, you see that photo of Forgadio Blow and Alina Habba like that. And I, I hope your reaction is viscerally like, 
what the heck is this? This is dangerous. This is weird. She's not denying that Donald Trump is going to potentially Russia and Saudi Arabia to get money. What? It is Thursday, the 21st of March of 2024, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. Precious the Little English Yorkie is our door girl. And she will be seating you directly for our especially special daily special, Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays, a little bit of jambalaya, a little bit of spice in your life, and just a little, because I know for some people, too much spice is, well, too much. Not here. Our tolerance for spice is uh, quite large, though I must confess, I think that uh, in my long, long life of uh, gourmandness, some spices are a little bit too much for me. Maybe I'm not as adventuresome as I always thought I was. Well, I was adventuresome, and then you learn. It's like experimenting. Remember back in the day when people said, oh, I'm not addicted to drugs. I'm just experimenting. Well, at what point is the experiment over? Huh? 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 Well, it's sort of like that. So, how are you on this Thursday as we uh, uh, fall headlong into the weekend? And it is spring, so spring has sprung. We have uh, out like a uh, lamb <laughs> for March, going into April showers. April showers are beginning early during the lamb period of March. Yeah. So, I got like something going on with the atmospheric rivers flowing through the jet stream, but that's all right. It's not in the jet stream, but I like to, I like to say that. Well, anyway... That's by way of mentioning that when we do the weather later on, we're going to mention that we have quite a bit of rain in the offing, but uh, it's okay. I'll take it. Uh, We, well, not only will I take it, but the deep rooted trees here that populate Oregon will just love it. They need it. They do. What else has been going on? Well, we could go on about Jonathan Turley resurrecting a judge that had been dead for three years. We could, but um, but I sent that little joke to uh, to David earlier, and he went through it. So I don't really need to mention it too much other than how, how I've mentioned it already. Uh, what else? Well, uh, Trump is still on his tirade. I have this foreboding, and let me, or, or tell me if, if, you have the same foreboding. And that is, um, is this guy going to get away with it? Is it possible that the system is going to expose really how corrupt they are with this guy? Well, I don't know. Can we correct it? I sure hope so. We need a definite purge. Of course, it's going to be difficult because as I'm reminded by, um, uh, well, there's no other word for it. <laughs> MAGA supporter. And you know what that means. Uh, they they are quite surly when they mention that there's millions of them. And they're unhappy. They're suspicious. Well, no wonder. You know, when you get half-truths and disinformation and fear-mongering, of course you're going to be suspicious. Wouldn't one be, su- uh, you know, suspect that maybe... Those elements that have been driving whatever opinions and fears you may have are being used to manipulate you. I mean, isn't that what critical thinking is about? Am I being manipulated? And I have to say that if I want to just create the whole world of silos, I'm in a particular silo, and I guess that would be, you know, reasoning and uh, the ability to admit fault. I made a mistake. I'm going to change. So um, I also like to remind, well, there's no other word for it, the MAGA supporter, that really there's more millions of us 
who are really quite tired of your bullshit. I don't say that. But they know that's what I mean. As soon as you say we're not going to take, you know, put up with your bullshit, they're going to tone police you and shut you down because they're free speech absolutists. Which reminds me, I should, um, I, I would like to advise folks that if it's a little bit too much on Twitter for you, I have found actually, and I didn't think that this would be true. You know, I just figured it's going to be what it's always been. And what has it always been on Twitter? Well, it's been pretty much of a cesspool, hasn't it? Even before we called it a cesspool, it was still a cesspool. Uh, just not as bad. Well, I have found that since I blocked Elon Musk, my timeline, though it still has bots, trolls, and, you know, just outright MAGA Nazis, it, it really does seem to have cleaned up. So I would advise try that. If you're being inundated with just absolute malarkey over and over and over all day, try that. And I actually have to say that when I've responded in some sort of, you know, pro-democracy way, I don't get as much of the weird only fan type uh, uh, escort uh, uh, people who are apparently liking or RTing my my tweets. Interesting, huh? Like I said, you know, there's still bots and trolls out there, but there seems to be less. And I'm that, that that's something I've noticed also. Is that as far as I can tell, actual real people have been responding with likes, etc., rather than the only fans uh Russian Red Sparrow troll bots. Trying to suck you in. Yeah, just try it. Oh, boy. You know, when I was in grad school, I actually suspected that maybe I was uh, being uh, tested by, uh, well, a Chinese agent. I don't know. Was she? I don't know. <laughs> I sometimes wonder, was I? It was fun while it lasted, but they apparently found out that I have no pertinent information. I'm just there for the fun and games. And once you get in the fun and games with a person like me, you, you can't blackmail me. You can't blackmail people who just admit to the fact that, yeah, I was in it for the fun and games. So <laughs> I don't know anything. Talk to me about, I don't know, Descartes, Descartes and Blake. We'll, we'll speak about that. I have some information about that. Would you like to know? They already knew, so I didn't need to tell them. All right. Well, we're I guess we're just meandering here, aren't we? Yes, we are. And what I meant to say without all this meandering is that we should just get right into what we have in store for you because we do have a few longer uh, articles that we'd like to get through today. And... What do we have in store for you in the Bistro Cafe at the top? Yes, that was Midas Touch breaking it down about Haba's refusal to answer if Trump's going to take money from foreign powers. You know, hostile foreign powers. And no one's going to convince me that Saudi Arabia is nothing but a hostile foreign power. OK, come on. Yep, he's going to take money. I guess that's OK. There's no law against it. And why is that? Mm -hmm. There used to be. Now there's not. Two groups are responsible. Federalist Society, Heritage Foundation, and by extension, then that means the Kochs. Not George Soros. <laughs> yeah, that's why they bring up Soros. So they can get away with their Nazi takeover. Blame the Jew. On the rest of the menu, questions swirl. Over the reasons why 40 prominent Napa Valley wine owners. See what I did there? And businesses were subpoenaed by the Department of Justice. Even the airport got subpoenaed. Authorities are still searching for two white supremacist Idaho prison inmates after they ambushed and shot three corrections officers. And I just checked. They still haven't caught them. And the Los Angeles Dodgers fired Shohei Otani's longtime interpreter 
for engaging in a, quote, massive theft, end quote, of the ballplayer's funds to place bets with an illegal bookmaker. I told you gambling and sports don't mix. They already had the Black Sox scandal. Come on. After the break, we move to the chef's table where the French Competition Authority hit Google with another big fine tied to a long-running dispute over payments to French publishers for their news. And an Amsterdam court ruled that Dutch national airline KLM made misleading statements and accused the carrier of greenwashing. That's going around, too. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. give you the usuals that we usually reserve for this usual time tomorrow so that we can, uh, well, tuck into this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And it is out of the Los Angeles Times by Jessica Garrison. Highway 29 winds along the floor of the Napa Valley through Yontville and St. Helena and up into Calistoga passing by vineyards that produce some of the most celebrated and expensive wines in the world. The road, lined with rows of grapevines planted along sun-dappled hills, is justly famous for its stunning beauty and the stunning number of Michelin-rated restaurants, spas, and boutique inns that have popped up among the vineyards. And lately, for locals anyway, it is also the source of a pressing mystery. Why have so many of the fancy wineries along this road and their rich and powerful owners been named in federal subpoenas that were served late last year on Napa County? Please provide any and all documents relating to the following individuals, entities, and or projects, one subpoena says, before unspooling a roster that reads more like a high-end tourist brochure than what is normally found in a court docket. Among the glittering names whose county records are being sought are Hall Wines, known for its bold Cabernets and Looks St. Helena Winery with a towering statue of a silver rabbit. Catherine Hall, a former U.S. ambassador to Austria, is also named, as is her husband Craig Hall, a former part owner of the Dallas Cowboys whose Art collection is so revered that portions went on loan to the Jeux de Pomme Arts Center in Paris. That's Paris in English. Camus Vineyards, whose Cabernet is a frequent favorite of wine spectator and owner Charles J. Chuck Wagner, are listed in the records request, as are Wagner's son Charlie and his vineyard Marisole. The inventory of luminaries rolls on. Robin Baggett, a former general counsel for the Golden State Warriors and his Alpha Omega winery. Dave Finney, whose prisoner label changed the industry. Grant Long Jr. and his wineries, Aonair and Reverie 2. Jason Woodbridge and Hundred Acre. Darius Kaladi and his namesake winery. And on it goes. 40 people in businesses in total, including 
Napa's exclusive Meritage Resort and Spa. I should note here for, well, you know, uh, transparency purposes, I uh, have cooked as a as a chef on pretty much all of these wineries. And there's always a big bash during pressing time where everybody shows up and you put on a big bash. So I've run into a few of these people. So what is it that they're looking for? Well, let's go on. The subpoena seeking records on the wineries and their owners dated December 14th of 23 is filed under the name of Patrick Robbins, first assistant U.S. attorney for the Northern District of California. It also references an FBI agent, Catherine Ferrado, who has experience working on complex financial crimes. Separately, a trial attorney working in the Department of Justice's Antitrust Division filed a subpoena dated on December 7th, requesting records pertaining to the Upper Valley Waste Management Agency, a joint powers authority that manages trash and recycling services for Calistoga, St. Helena, and Yauntville. A third subpoena seeks records on the Napa County Airport, which local officials are seeking to modernize. A fourth was served on the county's Farm Bureau, which in recent years has become a powerful political voice on behalf of the wineries. If Napa County officials have any idea what's going on, they are not saying, Napa County is not being investigated. County spokesperson Holly Dawson said, I'm just making up the accent as I usually do, as you know. We were issued a subpoena for records. We know nothing more. Of course they don't. The U.S. Attorney's Office in San Francisco declined to comment, as did the FBI San Francisco office, because they don't want me making up accents for them either. Some of those named in the probe did not respond to interview requests. Some who did respond said they are stumped. Craig and Catherine Hall released a statement through their Director of Public Relations. We are aware that there is an ongoing investigation. However, we do not know the scope of the details, and it would be inappropriate for us to speculate, the couple said in an accent made up on the spot. Bagot of Alpha Omega said his operations had nothing pending before the county and therefore zero documents that would have been turned over. He said it has been a big waste of time daily explaining that we have done nothing wrong. Bagot dismissed the probe as a fishing expedition, or worse, adding, I hope it's not a political witch hunt. Well, yeah, you know. Like several people interviewed, Bagot speculated that one person of interest could be Napa County Supervisor Alfredo Pedroza, who has generated ire among local environmental activists because he is perceived as pro-agriculture, which in Napa Valley almost always means pro-winery. Some of the entities whose records were subpoenaed have donated to Pedroza's political campaigns, a small number were involved in a controversial land deal involving Pedroza's family that is adjacent to property the Halls sought to develop in Napa Valley's eastern hills. Now, for years, Craig and Catherine Hall had sought to construct a 208-acre vineyard on Walt Ranch. Now, that's 2,300 acres of oak woodland they own in Napa's Atlas Peak Appalachian, prized for its elevation and rich volcanic soil. The property was undeveloped when the Halls bought it in 2005, but zoned for agriculture. Their efforts to clear space for a vineyard drew fierce opposition from environmental groups that said it would endanger oak trees and animal habitat, deplete limited water supplies, and boost the fire risk. After years of regulatory and legal wrangling, the development was tentatively approved by the Board of Supervisors in late 2021, but Rosa voted in favor of the project. His vote set off a new controversy when a local activist, uh, documentary filmmaker Beth Nelson, 
discovered that Pedroza's father-in-law had bought property adjacent to the proposed vineyard. The San Francisco Chronicle followed with reports that Pedroza and his wife helped secure a loan for the purchase using his Napa home as collateral. Critics said the Walt Ranch development would no doubt raise property values in the area, including the property Pedroza's father-in-law had purchased, and that Pedroza should have publicly disclosed his involvement as a conflict of interest. Pedroza denied he had a financial interest in the property, but recused himself from subsequent votes on Walt Ranch. In late 2022, the Halls gave up on the idea of developing the vineyard and worked out a deal to preserve the land through the County Land Trust. Now, I should also note that I've been on Walt Ranch. There's been a few events there in the past now. This is actually back when they took over uh, Walt Ranch in 2005. I had been doing some events and uh, visiting friends there, too, uh, uh, in the late 90s, so before they took it over. Now, the FBI searched Pedroza's home in December, according to the Santa Rosa Press Democrat. He opted not to run for another term on the Board of Supervisors and will and his tenure later this year. You know, interviews by the DOJ will do that to you. Now, of course, Pedroza did not respond to calls and emails seeking comment from the Times because do you really want me making up a, uh, an accent on the spot? Do they? Do they ever? Earlier this month, he sent an email statement to the press Democrat. Oh, here's my chance. I believe everybody should cooperate fully with all branches of federal and state government, and I will always encourage citizens of Napa and all Napa public authorities to do so. There is no reason to do otherwise. Okay. How was that? Adding to the intrigue and the grief, and now there's no joke about this, a key figure in Napa County, Ryan Clobus, died in an apparent suicide in January weeks after the Department of Justice served a subpoena on the Napa County Farm Bureau, which Clovis headed. Clovis joined the Farm Bureau in 2017 as policy director and was named chief executive in 2018. Under his leadership, the Bureau doubled its membership and formed a political action committee to work on behalf of the Bureau that raised funds to successfully defeat a county initiative that would have limited the growth of wineries. The Bureau's interim CEO, Tawny Tosconi, confirmed the Bureau had received a subpoena, but declined any additional comment. As the mystery swirls, one thing is clear. The federal probe comes amid a bitter divide among longtime vintners and residents over Napa Valley's future. Should the Valley keep adding vineyards, or is or has the proliferation of wineries and tourists and traffic reached a tipping point that threatens to erode its natural environment and rural charm, no matter how pretty the rows of grapes in the slanting afternoon light? You should say this back in the 90s. It's got to be worse. Jeff Ellsworth, a former mayor of St. Helena, is among those who believe the Forces of development pose a grave risk to the Valley's environment and invites political corruption. What's more, he worries that the influx of hotels and tourist attractions are hollowing out his hometown and others on the Valley floor. He grew up in St. Helena and returned about a decade after years in Los Angeles, said a breaking point for him was when he learned of a proposal to redevelop St. Helena City Hall into a hotel as well as a decision that did away with tiered water rates. I was like, wait a second, he said. Soon after, he decided to run for city council and eventually became mayor. And then he started hearing about problems at the landfill in the hills above Calistoga, which takes in trash from many of the wineries as well as waste from nearby counties. Fires, he said. Radioactive waste. I'm the mayor, and I'm like, what is going on? Ellsworth eventually joined forces with another citizen concerned about the landfill and Wheaton. Now a couple, 
They have devoted the last few years to exposing what they say is a complicated web of environmental and worker safety violations that they worry could make the landfill hazardous. And in late 2020, Ellsworth said he was sufficiently outraged that he reached out to the Department of Justice. He and Wheaton were gratified to read the subpoena the department filed with the county, asking about the dealings with the Upper Valley Waste Management Agency. It seeks information on contracting, as well as communications among agencies and elected officials. Johnson and Mark Thiessen of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grist Thursdays. Authorities are searching for a white supremacist Idaho prison inmate and an accomplice who fled after the accomplice shot and wounded corrections officers as they were transporting the inmate from a Boise hospital. Police said Nicholas Uppenauer is suspected of shooting two corrections officers during Wednesday's ambush in the ambulance bay at St. Alphanus Regional Medical Center. A warrant with a $2 million bond has been issued for his arrest on two charges of aggravated battery against law enforcement and one charge of aiding and abetting an escape. He and inmate Skyler Meade drove off early Wednesday after the shooting in a gray 2020 Honda Civic with Idaho plates. It is not known where they are or where they are headed, police said Wednesday evening. That was last night. Three corrections officers were shot and wounded during the attack, two allegedly by Uppenauer and one by responding police, which will be uh, uh, charged uh, as Uppenauer's fault. So that's how that goes. Officials describe Meade, 31, as a white supremacist gang member. Meade was sentenced to 20 years in 2017 for shooting at a sheriff's sergeant during a high-speed chase. The attack occurred occurred at 2.15 in the morning as Idaho Department of Corrections officers prepared to bring Meade back to prison. Department Director Josh Tuolt said during a news conference yesterday afternoon that Meade was taken to the hospital at 9.35 p.m. on on Tuesday after he engaged in self-injurious behavior and medical staff determined he needed emergency care. Oh, really? One officer shot by the suspect was in critical but stable condition, while the second officer had serious but non-life-threatening injuries. The third injured corrections officer also sustained non-life-threatening injuries when a responding officer, incorrectly believing the shooter was still in the emergency room and seeing an on person near the entrance, open fire. The attack came amid a wave of gun violence at hospitals and medical centers in Idaho, which have struggled to adapt to the threats.
Gustavo Ariano heads a slew of other reporters from the Los Angeles Times for this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Representatives of Dodgers superstar Shohei Hotani on Wednesday accuses interpreter of engaging in a massive theft of the baseball baseball players' funds to place bets with an allegedly illegal bookmaker who is the target of a federal investigation. Lawyers for Otani made that claim after the Times learned that Otani's name had surfaced in the investigation of Matthew Bauer, an Orange County resident. Otani's representatives looked into the actions of the interpreter, Ipe Mizahara, in response to the Times queries, a source close to the matter said. Two sources told the newspaper that the money involved was in the millions of dollars. In a statement, the West Hollywood law firm Burke Brettler said in the course of responding to recent media inquiries, we discovered that Shohei has been the victim of a massive theft and we are turning the matter over to the authorities. The Dodgers on Wednesday yesterday fired Muzahara, a team spokesman said. One of the sources said that Muzahara was not truthful when asked about the Times' inquiries. He was still interpreting for Otani on Wednesday in Seoul. Now, Major League Baseball's gambling policy prohibits any player, umpire, or club or league official or employee from betting on the game or making illegal bets on other sports. The punishment for gambling with an illegal bookmaker or their agent is not specified in MLB rules, but is left up to such penalty as the commissioner deems appropriate in light of the facts and circumstances of the conduct. Mizahara was born in Japan and grew up in Southern California. He graduated from Diamond Bar High School in 2003, where he played on the soccer team, then attended UC Riverside. Muzahara first crossed paths with Otani while working as an English language interpreter for American players on the Nippon Ham Fighters, Otani's Japanese team, and the Nippon Professional Baseball League. When Otani signed with the Angels in late 2017, Muzahara became his personal interpreter. And then Muzahara followed Otani to the Dodgers during the offseason. Well, that brings us to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new Earth. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to NetRootsRadio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our NetRootsRadio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution and you'll get a wondiferous pair of Netroots radio stickers for application to your backpack, your bumper sticker, or your banjo. Well, it's up to you which backpack you want to put it on. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetrootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. Thank you. 
You're listening to the American Democracy Minute, keeping your government buy-in for the people. A new report chronicles a brain drain of experienced professional election officials who, after dealing for months on end with false election fraud claims, intimidation, and burdensome new election integrity rules, have had enough. Pro-Democracy Group Issue 1 analyzed Western state data and news reports and found that 98% of Arizona voters will vote in precincts with new election officials since 2020, and that 12 of 15 counties have new officials. Colorado lost a combined 314 years of experience when election officials in 24 of 64 counties stepped down. Election officials cite an increasing workload, threats, and a frustration with activists. An Arizona County election official told women's news site the 19th, The reality is there are a lot of people who don't want to know the truth. They've continued for almost two years with the emails, going to public meetings, and heckling from the audience. In an interview with Issue 1, Nevada Secretary of State Francisco Aguilar said, Nevada has lost more than half of our top county election officials since the 2020 election, and many more staff within election offices across the state. This has led to a critical loss of institutional knowledge and staffing shortages ahead of the 2024 presidential election. We have Issue 1's full report linked from AmericanDemocracyMinute.org. I'm Brian Beal. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. A little bit of jambalaya, a little bit of spice in your life. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America where it is currently 45 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting highs in the mid to upper 60s, sunshines and clouds mixed throughout the day, winds out of the northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour, mostly cloudy overnight with lows in the mid to upper 40s, winds light and variable, then showers early tomorrow, Friday, becoming a steady rain later in the day, Highs near 60, winds out of the west-northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. And we should be getting uh, a quarter to a half inch of rain on Friday and at least that much daily uh, through the weekend and uh, totals approaching that throughout next week. Looks like pollen is rated as none here in our little village of Rogue River. The air quality index for the region is in the good range at 27 parts per million. And that daytime UV index is moderate at level 4. You better begin to take care if you haven't already. Barometric pressure is rising for a bit more at 30 Point one inches. Visibility is up to 9 miles and relative humidity is at 98%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world and that is the weather underground. London is 61 degrees and cloudy. Paris is 68 and sunny. Rome is 65 and sunny. Bagram is 46 and mostly cloudy. Hong Kong is 60 degrees and clear. Tokyo is 38 degrees and clear. Melbourne, Victoria, Australia is 55 and clear. San Francisco, California is 55 and cloudy. Chicago, Illinois is 34 degrees and cloudy. And New York, New York is 37 degrees Fahrenheit, partly cloudy with a special weather statement about low humidity and wildfire risk. So take care. 
And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. of the Associated Press brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. France's competition watchdog hit Google yesterday, Wednesday, with another big fine tied to a long-running dispute over payments to French publishers for their news. The French Competition Authority said it issued the $272 million U.S. penalty because of Google's failure to comply with some commitments it made in a negotiating framework. The dispute is part of a larger effort by authorities in the EU and around the world to force Google and other tech companies to compensate news publishers for content. The U.S. tech giant was forced to to uh, negotiate with publishers after a court in 2020 upheld an order saying payments were required by a 2019 European Union copyright directive. Google said in a blog post that it, it agreed to settle a fine which was imposed over how it conducted the negotiations because, as Google said, it's time to move on. They want their life back. It said the fine was not proportionate to the issues raised by the French watchdog and does not sufficiently take into account Google's efforts to answer and resolve the concerns. In other words, the fine should have been higher. France was the first of the EU's 27 nations to adopt the copyright directive, which lays out a way for publishers and news companies to strike licensing deals with online platforms. Porter of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. In a decision hailed by an environmental group as a historic victory, an Amsterdam court ruled that Dutch national airline KLM misled consumers in statements about sustainable aviation in a case that accused the carrier of greenwashing. Amsterdam District Court said in a statement that in some advertisements there are no that are no longer in use, KLM makes environmental claims based on vague and general statements about environmental benefits, thereby misleading consumers, just like they learned from their oil companies here in America. The court said that in other cases, KLM paints an overly rosy picture of the effects of measures such as sustainable aviation fuels and reforestation. The court said such measures only marginally reduce the negative environmental aspects and gives the wrong impression that flying with KLM is sustainable. Greenwashing, of course, refers to claims that aim to deceive the public about how environmentally friendly a product policy or organization is. Hmm. Would a major company use greenwashing to deceive their customers? Uh, a major corporation would. Mm 
Mm-hmm. All right, that brings us to the end of our broadcasting period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up here tomorrow for Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coère Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Thank you.